Hi, I'm Eric Rhodes, publisher of Fine Art Connoisseur and Plen Air Magazine. Thank you for tuning in today. You know, sometimes we're walking through the woods and there we are, we got our easel with us and we set up and we go, oh my goodness, there's a waterfall, but how do I paint it? Well, now you're going to learn how to paint waterfalls in oil. This is with Howard Friedland. Enjoy. Hi, I'm Howard Friedland. In this video, I'm going to talk about and show you how I approach painting Virginia Falls and Glacier National Park. My wife, artist Susan Blackwood, and I lived in Montana for many years, and if you've ever had a chance to get up to Glacier National Park, you'll see that the, the views are beautiful and there's plenty to paint up there. I really highly recommend it. It's ex exquisite. I'll show you practical ways of starting, developing, and finishing a painting so you can follow along chapter by chapter as I go from my planning stage all the way to my finishing touches. I'm also going to share some specifics about all the things you'll find around a waterfall like rocks, cliffs, trees, bushes, water, and of course every artist has his or her own process, but when you boil it all down, the same skills and principles apply when you're painting something real. I'm talking about designing and executing an exciting composition. So first things first, let's talk about some of the elements of waterfalls. So here are some quotes and images I've put together to get us all in the mood to paint a beautiful waterfall painting. What is it about water that sparks our imaginations? It's something very primal in humans that draws folks to paintings which include water, like oceans, rivers, streams, and yes, waterfalls. People will hike miles to get a view of an awesome waterfall. Painters will climb steep, rocky trails with their painting gear to paint them. At times, I've even set up in very precarious situations to get the best angle to view my composition. Waterfalls have movement. They can be thunderously crashing and loud or delicate trickles that drip down from cliffs. They can tumble gently over boulders in a river or drop precipitously from great heights. In any form, as artists, our goal will be to capture the essence, the glistening light, and the animated nature of falling water. Before we get started painting, let's review some of the important elements of waterfalls. Composition, value, and edge control are important in making the falling water look real and not look like a cutout and pasted on like a bed sheet hanging from a window. Along with these fundamental relationships, I'll talk about the way light and shadow, reflectivity and transparency affect the colors of waterfalls. I've created a board with preparatory material like sketches and a field study and some photos and a color swatch to prepare myself for when I actually do the finished painting. I'll have some good reference material right here at my fingertips. Now here I have a pencil sketch and it has some values and I've, I've made some changes uh, in my photo, original photograph uh, for compositional reasons and so I have good value masses here. Uh, I have my darkest dark, my lightest light, and my middle values, uh, middle dark gray, middle light gray. This is the field study that I did uh, out on location. These here are some color swatches that kind of pick up certain areas of the painting uh, so that when I'm mixing for the final painting, my demo, uh, I'll be able to match them and at least get some general color down before I start adjusting it. It's not like I'm going to be matching each exact color the way I have it here. It just gives me a little bit of a head start. 
So first, let's talk a little bit about my photo reference and how I adjusted it so I can get a better composition for my painting. Here's a way of manipulating your photograph to give you a better composition. Here's a graphic that I have to show you how I changed the original photograph. The one on the left is the original photograph. I wanted the waterfall to flow to make it look a little bit more important and more of a focal point. So uh, in a photo manipulation program like Photoshop, you can stretch things and uh, change them to your liking. In the second one, you'll see where these red uh, lines are. What I did, I brought the whole waterfall and clipped down further in the photograph so the, the waterfall is much more prominent. And in the last image here, you see uh, that's the final uh, adjustment. I'm going to actually adjust things even further as I paint because you're not trying to copy any photograph or any photo reference. It's just there to, to give you some ideas. So I may be changing them even further in my painting. Okay, on this second graphic here, I want to show you how you can do that if you don't have a photo manipulation program or don't have Photoshop or anything like that. You can, all you need to do is you can take a piece of tracing paper print out uh, a, a photo on your printer and then put a piece of tracing paper over it and you can move the tracing paper to relocate different things in the in the image wherever you want and then um, in the second image here I have uh, you can see the tracing paper is over the uh, original and I just move it that way uh, not doing it digitally but doing it manually and in the third uh, image here, I have the, uh, the final result of what I want to paint. So I have a no-tan image, which is a no-tan image is just uh, a black and white uh, version of the scene so that you can see the breakdown of light and dark. There's no uh, gray value in it whatsoever or color. It's just showing you what the uh, black and white design is uh, so that you get a good idea is if the uh, composition is a good composition. And then I have another one with a three uh, value breakdown, just showing your lightest lights, your darkest darks, and some middle values in a middle value. And then I have one of uh, just a black and white version of the color. And all these uh, are to check my values. Now that you've seen my photo adjustments, Let's move on and talk about some of the materials I'll be using. Before we get started, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about some of the tools and paints that I'll be using. So here I have my palette, and I have a color wheel here, and I'll show you how the colors that I'm using relate. Uh, so basically, I have three primary colors. I have my blues, I have my yellows, and I have my reds. Everything else can be mixed from that, but I have a full spectrum palette here just, just to show you um, some of the uh, warmer and cooler versions of the color. So this is cadmium chartreuse, which is a very cool, almost a greenish yellow. And this is a warmer yellow. This is cadmium yellow deep. This is cadmium orange. And you could, if you wanted to, you could make the cadmium yellow deep by mixing these two together, the chartreuse and the orange. And then I have a cadmium red medium. Uh, and if you wanted to make it more of a cadmium uh, red light, you could add some of the orange. And then this is a cadmium red deep, which is somewhere in between the medium and the alizarin crimson, which is more of a violet red. It has a little bit more of the blue in it, and it's darker. Then this is dioxazine violet. Then over here, I go to the blues. This is a cobalt blue, which I feel is the coldest blue, and it's also the most neutral blue. Uh, and then ultramarine blue, which has a little bit of red in it, so it's leaning more towards the violet blue. Then this is cerulean blue, which is leaning a little bit warmer towards the, the greenish side compared to the other two blues. And that's a cerulean blue. Then this is viridian green. I like viridian green because you can bend it warm or cool 
very easily by either adding some yellow, uh, any of the yellows to warm it, or any of the blues that will cool it. Here I have uh, permanent green, uh, which uh, light, I believe it is, which is a warm green. So these are the colors that match up to everything on the color wheel here. Um, then uh, over here I have three auxiliary colors, which uh, are earth colors. This is yellow ochre, this is burnt sienna, and this is Van Dyke brown. These colors are very good in uh, graying down some of the stronger cadmium colors. And uh, you can use, use them to gray them down or just use them by themselves. Uh, the, another way you can gray down a color is by using the complementary color. So color has four um, elements to it. First is the hue. The hue is just the name of the color. It's the local color of whatever the object is that you're painting. The second one is value, and that's how light or how dark a version is it. And then the third one is temperature, and that has to do with how warm or how cool it is. And then the, the, the last one is uh, chroma, and that has to do with how intense or chromatic or, or uh, saturated it is, and, uh, or how gray down it is. And that comes really in handy when you're trying to get a sense of space and distance in a painting. So the function of value is to get separation of objects, a light against a dark, a, a, light, uh, a dark thing against a light thing. Uh, the function of temperature is to get a sense of light and shadow. If you have a warm light source, like the sun for instance, uh, and it illuminates whatever plane it is of the object that you're painting, that will be a warm version of whatever the local color is. And in the shadow side, where it's not getting illuminated by the sun, it would be a cooler version. And that's where uh, the color wheel comes in handy. Okay, the fourth thing, uh, the function of chroma, as I said before, is to get a sense of foreground, middle ground, and background. As things recede in space, they get less and less uh, intense in color. So an example I like to give is if I was painting a barn from 20 feet away, for instance, that barn may, if it's a red barn, it could be a pretty bright red. But if I were to go about 200 yards back and I still see the barn in my, um, in my view, I couldn't paint it the same red. I'd have to somehow knock it down and neutralize it and make it less chromatic so it stays into the background. That's how we get a sense of space and distance. So chroma and bright and dull or brilliant and grayer uh, really helps you to get the sense that this is, this is in the foreground and that's way in the background and it gives that illusion. Uh, the function, again, of uh, warm and cool is to show light and shadow. So you have the three primary colors, the three secondary colors, so red, blue, and yellow are the primaries. You mix the two primaries together, the yellow and the red, and to get a secondary color is the orange. And yellow and blue, the secondary color is green and blue and red, the secondary col color is violet. And then the tertiary colors are colors that are, uh, you get by mixing a primary color and a secondary color together. So if you mix um, red and orange, you get red-orange or orange-red, depending on how, how much red or how much orange you put in. Uh, if you mix orange and yellow, you get yellow-orange or uh, orange-yellow. If there's more ye yellow in it, then it's an orangish yellow, and so on and so forth. Those are called analogous colors. So they're just, it's another way of saying they're just the next door neighbor color. So if I have something in, and the local color is yellow, some kind of a yellow, um, then if I want to warm it up, I would lean it more in towards this side. And if I want to cool it off, I would lean it more towards the greenish side of yellow, because that's leaning more towards the blues, and the blues are the cooler colors. So let's say I have a red barn, and the red barn is in sun, sunlight. 
So in sunlight, it would lean more towards the orangish side, the warmer side. And in the shadow of the barn, it would lean more towards the violet or the red, uh, red violet side of it to create that warm and cool. In painting, everything is opposites. Uh, warm against cool, light against dark, bright against dull, and so on and so forth. So that's my, uh, my color palette. I hear, here I have in my whites, I have a titanium white, which is in the middle. And then this is a cool white, uh, uh, and this is a warm white. If I wanted to warm something up and I wanted to lighten it at the same time, if I use the uh, regular uh, titanium white, it has a tendency to cool things. But if I want to keep it warm, I could add some of this uh, warmer uh, white and keep it light, but keep it warm. And the same thing is true with this cool white. Uh, so I don't always use the warm and the cool version. I mostly just use the titanium white, but I thought for this demo I would uh, use the, the warm and the cool light as well uh, and see how that works out. So uh, that, then I have a variety of different brushes. I always start off with a soft, uh, flat. This is a bright, and it's a large one because when I first start, I'm going to want to keep things nice and flat and uh, bold, and then I'll work from larger to smaller brushes. Uh, and then I have a couple of palette knives that I'll be using uh, to mi either to mix color or to work on the actual painting with them. I have, as I said, I have some mediums here. This is like a cold wax uh, gel. This is the, uh, it, it's the non-solvent uh, medium. And I have a variety of brushes that I'll be using as I go. I have some other things like I use a mirror to check out uh, things. I, I use a variety of different tools to manipulate paint. I have a pair of uh, value glasses. These take the uh, color out, but you still see the value relationship when you look through these. And you use these to compare your reference and your painting side by side, so you're matching uh, apples with apples, so to speak. That's basically it on my materials. So let's get on with the uh, block-in stage. Before I start painting on the canvas, I wanted to show you that I have a printout that I made of the scene that I'm going to be painting. Uh, I've gridded it in uh, 16 um, sections. So I just drew a line halfway vertically, halfway horizontally, and then quartered it. And so this will help me with my drawing and getting uh, accurate uh, placement of the elements of my painting. I also did it on my canvas the same way. It's very important that you get the proportions uh, accurate. So um, you have to get, if this, this uh, canvas is a, an 18 by 14 canvas, and I uh, printed this out to the same proportions. And so if, if you have a print and you have a canvas that are two different uh, proportions, you're going to run into trouble. Uh, this has to be apples and apples. It has to be the same thing. So I'm going to use this print to first give myself some guidelines as to where some of these elements are, where the trees are, where the waterfall is. And I'm not going to completely stick to, stick to this. Uh, where I see I, I may want to move something over, I can still do that. I'm not married to the reference material. It's just there as a guide for me, and um, it, I'm constantly thinking design and constantly thinking about uh, this would be better if it was nudged over you know, just a little bit, or, or if, if this was at a little bit more of an angle, let's try that. So that's what I'm going to be doing. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to start giving myself some of these guidelines. And I think I'm just going to use some yellow ochre. And I'm going to thin it a little bit so that um, it flows pretty easily on my canvas. And I'm going to use a small brush just to give myself some lines. So I'll go with the, uh, the big shapes first. 
this is a block in it, and it means what it says. It's like putting big blocks in a kid's puzzle. You put the big pieces in first, and then you narrow, you break it down to narrower um, pieces. So I see this, this tree comes down about like so. This is a very important part of the, the painting because the waterfall, it's about the waterfall. So I want lots of neat angles and I don't want anything really pointing to the corner, so. Lots of lines and angles. That creates movement and excitement. And waterfalls are exciting. I may make it even this even lower, just to exaggerate it a little bit more than what I have in the picture. And then this, this tree comes down to about here, across. Then the log, the major log comes, it looks pretty straight, but I think I'm gonna angle it a little bit more to kind of bring, bring the eye up. So in the picture, the log comes across pretty much like that. But I think I'm gonna turn it a little bit more like, like that. So that it has a little bit more movement to it. And you can always change it. Maybe make it a little bit lower. This is the time to make these corrections for your um, composition. Because once you have a ton of paint up there, and, and this is the line for, for where the, uh, the waterfall hits the, the little stream or whatever it is it's flowing into. Now, these trees, I don't want them to be completely the same. I want to have one be bigger, one more dominant than the other. So I'll have the f closest one. Be more prominent. And then this one will come forward, this one will go back a little bit. So you can push and pull these things in this stage. I'm just giving myself an, pretty much an embouchure onto which I'm going to be putting my, my dark and light values and so on and so forth. And then the waterfall comes down. Like that, there's a little bush here, comes across this, this, a little bit of a crevice in the rocks. Then, let's see. Lots of searching lines. The idea is to get the feeling of the water really coming down. There's some
And come down here, I think. And this yellow ochre is very easy to work on top of, so I'm not too worried about making any kind of permanent indelible marks on it at this point. And then the waterfall comes down here, and it comes down here. I'm going to make that a little lower. Oh, the other th one of the other things I did uh, when I manipulated the photograph originally is the original photograph had this uh, little drip coming down right under the waterfall. I moved it. I moved it over to here because it brings the eye over. So there's a little drip coming down here to kind of this, this is going to lead you to this, this will lead you up to that. And so I try to get some rhythm going from the very beginning. And then there's a little bit of light hitting, hitting the water. It doesn't look like much now, but once I start getting some values in, um, it'll start to read a little bit better. So I'm mostly concerned with getting the values in first. There'll be color, so if something is green it, and I want it dark, it'll be a dark green. But I have to subdivide this canvas now into the various values that I see to have some separation from one thing to another thing. The exact color will come once I have that established. Then uh, on the next uh, run at it, I will then really try to narrow down and get color to be more exactly the way I want it. But here, it's just the value that has to be exact. I'm just going to start with a large brush uh, and a large soft brush. And I'm going to take a dark color like this Van Dyke brown. I may dip into a little of this so that it flows nicely. And I'm going to squint and look at my reference. It's important to squint because what happens is you don't see all the little details. You just see the big block masses. And that's what we want to, that's what it is. You're blocking in masses. So um, I'm seeing, and I think I'll add some green to it. Let me put some thinner out. Now everything is going to look ultra dark now because everything being relative, I'm working against a white canvas. Once I start getting some of the other things um, blocked in, now they won't look as dark because there'll be other things to compare. Then there's a waterfall here. There's a little, the, and these brushes are nice because you can use them on the uh, on the side to get a line, or you can use them on the flat edge to get a nice flat. I'm just looking at shapes. I'm not trying to draw water, trees, leaves, or anything. I'm just looking at the abstract design. Oops slipped a little bit. Okay. Right 
think this needs to be a little wider. You can wipe out. That's the nice thing about oil paints is they're very forgiving. You can correct things very easily. So then there's the, um, the log. And it, it may not look like much at this point. It probably won't. But this is necessary so that you keep things masked in and not too much detail in the beginning. Detail is the last thing you have to worry about. And there's plenty of time for that. So this tree comes down, it's kind of dark, just spaces in here. So the, these are my darkest darks that I'm seeing up there. Gets a little bit lighter a little bit lighter up in here. I'll be working in on top of all this, but this is my in initial, and it has to be just flat, a flat pattern, like that no tan that I made that no tan print. Then there are some, so those, those are my darkest values. Now I'll go to my middle darks. So I'm just going to take this and um, lighten it a little bit. It's still pretty dark. I test it against my darks to see see if it's a little bit lighter. I think it could be a little greener. I could mix uh, these colors on my palette first, which would be helpful, but I'm just going to go for it. Now this is the waterfall, so I don't want to into that. So basically I'm making a coloring book type of thing where I'm filling in some of these lines. In value, color value. If I see it brighter, I'll make it a little bit brighter. But I'm squinting, so I'm not, I'm keeping the integrity of each value in, in the sense that I'm not going as light as anything else. I'm keeping it maybe one or one and a half values at most.
And then this area in here and this area in here. This would be the next darkest. And it's got more of a violet, violet color. Maybe a little burnt sienna. I'm just guessing, really, but as long as the value is, is right. Should be about the same value, but maybe a, a hair lighter is that. And you put a little touch of it on here to test to see how it compares. I guess everything is comparing one thing to another. And this blocking is extremely important because if you get this all messed up, then everything you put on top of it is going to be um, incorrect. Just getting rid of the white where the white doesn't belong, basically. And it gets a little cooler at the top. Might be getting some influence of the sky. It's, um, I'm comparing this value to the value behind it. It's all comparing and relationships of one thing to another thing. One thing will be a little lighter, one thing will be a little darker, warmer, cooler, brighter, or duller. When I use the word dull, what I'm talking about is uh, saturation or intensity or chroma. I don't want a little white things poking in. So now I'm going to get to the, the trees. Let's see. Well, before I do that, I think I'm going to put a little color in this log. And the value is kind of a close value. Uh, now, th this is not the, the highlight of the log. This is the middle. I'm going to leave the white of the canvas to represent the highlight of the log. And when I work with uh, lighter colors, I want to just keep my palette pretty clean. It takes a second. And uh, I might even want to use a different brush. So I'm squinting down and I'm seeing this, the trees over here uh, are darker. They're darker and greener. I'm going to try some of this bright green and that, that I will modify with some of this burnt, uh, burnt sienna. I'm comparing how dark to make this shape in here compared 
to that shape and compare to that shape. Close. So the trees are in shadow over here. I don't want this to be the same, the same width as that. So I have to make certain decisions. One, I, I have to push one. This is going. This tree and this tree are going to kind of almost blend in. The trees behind and the shadow of this tree are going to be this value and that color. And I, I find this um, process very satisfying because it's kind of abs it's all it's very abstract. You're just looking at color shapes. You're not thinking in terms of I'm making a tree. It's supposed to look like a tree or what I think a tree looks like. It's just design. Design, comparing. It's a little game. One thing is one way. One thing is another way. How can I get it? And once you have this down, now this bottom of this tree is also, it's lighter though. A little bit yellower. Maybe oranger. Let me clean my brush and get a better color. The light hitting the, those um, trees is uh, pretty bright, and I want those trees to really light up. And the only way I can get these, these trees and this waterfall to light up in the sun is to have what's around it darker and cooler. So if I want that to be lighter and warmer, I have to have what's next to it darker and cooler. Everything in color is relative. You can get one color to look absolutely different if you put a different kind of color next to it. I'm squinting and I'm looking and comparing. I can't tell you exactly which color I'm mixing, but I'll give you the way to figure that out for yourself, which is I ask myself, what's the local color of the thing I'm painting? In other words, the local color is the color of something before it's on the effect of light and shadow. So if I'm wearing a red shirt and I'm standing out in the sunshine and the angle of the sun is hitting my shirt on one side, well, the local color of the shirt is red. Where the sun is hitting it, it's going to bend to a, towards a warmer red, like put a little orange in it or something going towards the warmer colors. And in the shadow, it'll be cooler. It'll be more of a, uh, a violet red. So I always ask myself, what's the local color of the thing I'm painting? What's the light source that's illuminating it? And is that making it look warmer or cooler? Is it in light or is it in shadow? And then I ask myself, where in the painting is it? Is it in the foreground? I might be able to go a little bit brighter with, with the chroma, a little more intense or uh, saturated. <clears throat> if that thing is in the background, though, I might want to knock it back and gray it a little bit so that it sits, sits in space a little bit further back. 
So you can see things are starting to develop. Now I'm going to put in some color for, and the reason I started on a white canvas as opposed to toning the canvas, sometimes I'll tone a canvas, but the reason I started on the white canvas is that I wanted these trees to really glow. And you can paint it so that the, if, I, if I had toned the canvas a darker color or middle value color, that under, under layer of canvas would, um, would show through. But when, when you put a um, color over a white canvas, the color will be more vibrant because the white is what's showing through. And I can go pretty pure with, with this color in here, this yellow of the tree, the shape, I should call it. So this one is forward. So it's going to be the brightest. The other one is close. It's a little bit further back, though. I'm not just wiping, I'm just trying to get it to really be, oh, clean the brush. Get it to be um, really right. One, one way is to, uh, if that's what my goal is, what I know about color is in order to get something to a yellow to be very look very bright and warm, what was I saying? I just have to get a cooler cool a cooler, more violet. Violet is the complement of yellow. So That'll push this. To be warmer. Top artist Howard Friedland shares his insider secrets on how to paint beautiful, captivating waterfalls. It's all in his new video, Painting Waterfalls in Oil. In this workshop, I'm going to show you how I paint loosely and impressionistically to really capture the mood and the feeling and the motion of a waterfall. In this video, Howard shares his secret for getting all the details right. He'll show you exactly how he paints the damp, misty atmosphere that makes a waterfall really come alive. If your paintings tend to be tight and getting into the details too soon, I think this workshop will be great for you to loosen up your painting style. Howard reveals his four key elements into a living waterfall painting. He'll show you how to create each of these effects in your paintings. The first two are light and shadow, done Howard's way but it's the next two that really make the painting come to life. It may seem like magic how he's able to do all of this, but it's not. Howard has a step-by-step -step system to bring the outdoors into the controlled environment of his studio. From the early block in, through the developmental stages, all the way to the finish, I'm gonna teach you how to paint a beautiful waterfall. In this video, he'll show you how he does it. And of course, a great waterfall painting isn't just about the waterfall itself. It's often the lush surrounding of trees, rocks, and cliffs that complete the story. Howard has developed, refined, and proven his techniques. His career has been long and very successful. He knows how to really make all the elements in his painting sing. With what you learn from Howard, everything will seem to work better. And with his technique, you may find yourself looking at your finished work and being amazed at how you did it. 
Howard breaks it all down in a step-by-step, easy-to-learn format that you'll enjoy so much, it will seem effortless. Order the digital download version of Painting Waterfalls in Oil with Howard Friedland now, and you can have Howard talking to you in minutes. Or, if you prefer, the DVD version. Let us know, and we'll ship it right to your door. Well, that's the great Howard Friedland painting watercolors in oil, and you can learn more about this brand new video at PaintTube.tv. And remember, we have a special discount code for you up in the comment section. Grab that now. In the meantime, watch this interview with Howard Friedland. So as a kid, I liked to draw a lot. And I had a friend in junior high that also liked to draw. And the two of us would take our sketchbooks. We'd go down to the Museum of Natural History in New York, where I grew up. And we would sit on the railings in front of the dioramas that they had of, the, of Africa with, with the uh, taxidermy animals and the backgrounds. And we would sketch the animals. And people would come and look over our shoulders and, uh, and enjoy watching us draw. And uh, that really got me going uh, as far as being interested in drawing. Later on, I uh, was accepted into the High School of Music and Art in New York, which is a special art high school, and they have music and art, obviously. So in, in that school, we would have different art classes. Like we'd have oil painting and watercolor and tempera, and we'd have art history. And um, uh, we also had the academics that we would need. And uh, so I got some painting. That's where I really started painting with oils. And then I uh, went on to college to uh, Cooper Union in uh, New York, which is a special uh, school of art and science. There I had some uh, oil painting classes, but mostly graphics, because I was going to be going into commercial art. And I worked in advertising in New York for many years uh, as an art director. And so I really had some sort of drawing implement in my hand, to doing layouts and, and comps for ads and commercials, and I would do storyboards. Uh, at some point, around 1972, I decided I wanted to get back into learning some, some more painting. And I, when I moved down to Miami, uh, I went to the Miami Art Center, where they had some painting classes. And I, at night, I would start taking some of the classes there. And Painting pretty much got into my blood. I really enjoyed it, and it was something that I really looked forward to doing all the time. And at, at some point, uh, I uh, decided that I wanted to make the transition between commercial art into the fine art. So at that time, in New Mexico, they had a lot of galleries that showed the type of painting that I liked, which is more representational painting, uh, paintings of landscapes and things. Uh, that time I was doing mostly uh, still life and figurative painting in, uh, in the studio type painting. But I wanted to get outside and start doing more landscape work. And I saw that uh, in the West they were doing a lot more of that. So I moved out to New, uh, New Mexico around uh, Albuquerque <coughs> and uh, started painting and taking some classes. And I started getting into some galleries. And then from there I just kept taking workshops from artists whose paintings I liked. It seems like drawing kind of came naturally to me. I, I just enjoyed doing it from an early age. Uh, and in order to get into high school, I had to create a portfolio uh, to be accepted. And also, they had a test. And uh, so because I had been drawing from an early age, I passed the test and was accepted into that high school. It just seems like something that I was almost destined to do or uh, dr drawn to, not to use a pun, but I was drawn into it, <laughs> to drawing. Painting and drawing and art is such a personal thing that I think every artist at some point or another uh, questions uh, whether, whether they're as good as they would like to be especially when they're looking at other artists who are more accomplished than they are. And they, they have this thing where they kind of compare themselves to other artists. That's something that uh, can be very damaging, I think, uh, if, if you let that get, get into your head a little bit too much. I think you have to keep reminding yourself that 
you're doing it because this is something that you love doing and that you want to do and that you almost, you kind of have to do in order to keep your, your feeling of happiness in life. Uh, it's very satisfying. It can be very frustrating at times when things don't come out, but if you take kind of a workmanlike attitude about it and just kind of work through some of those things, you, not everyone's gonna, no, no painter has every painting come out beautifully. You just, you do it because you like doing it and if you keep, continue to enjoy the process, then you, you'll just keep doing it and don't put too much pressure on yourself. Over time, it takes a, a long time before you, you feel like you've kind of hit a certain stride where you can you know, produce work that, that you feel satisfied is, is up to whatever level you're trying to accomplish. The part that I like the best about painting is just the process itself, just enjoying working with color, uh, seeing how color rea colors react to each other, uh, the drawing of the, the painting and trying to create whatever atmosphere and feeling that I'm trying to uh, accomplish. It's, uh, you know, over the years, it, it's taken me uh, to calm down a little bit with the process rather than rushing through it and uh, trying to get a finish too soon. Um, I keep telling myself to just S slow down and enjoy the process of applying the paint and just to play with it and have fun with it. The thing I like most about being an artist is it, it allows me to do my thing, to do, do what I feel strongly about and kind of follow my own muse uh, in terms of what I decide to paint and how I decide to paint it. Uh, I'm my own boss in that sense and also, I, I really enjoy meeting other artists and finding out their process and their experiences and uh, the fact that I'm able to do, do my craft wherever I go, see, see new things and different things all over the world and around the country. So I think being an artist really opens you up to being able to uh, experience life in a much broader way and to be able to see things uh, through a certain lens that artists look at things and not just take things for granted. What I think my paintings would reveal about me is uh, a free spirit, uh, just, um, I always like to think, I like jazz music and I like just kind of improvising. My process has, has certain stages of development, but at a certain point, I like to just kind of let it fly and just not think about that, uh, th those uh, principles too much and just go for it. And sometimes it works out and sometimes it doesn't, but when it really works and you're working from a certain part of your brain uh, that you can see some exciting things happen. Sometimes you don't even notice it until after the, you finish the painting. There's certain sections of your painting that are just magical and you don't even remember painting them, but at, you know, after the fact, you look at them. You don't. You really didn't. Don't know how you painted it. It's. It's just kind of came from your unconscious somehow. <laughs> but that can only happen if you just kind of loosen up and let let it fly at a certain point. The the subject is never ideal. It's what you do with the subject. It has nothing really to do with this. The only thing the subject does is it gives you a starting point. It's, it's kind of a model that you can pick and choose parts of. The, the composition and everything just really comes from your own perspective of things. And you can take the most mundane, ordinary subject and turn it into a, a beautiful painting. Or you can take the most spectacular subject, like a waterfall or the Grand Canyon or, or something that, or a sunset or something that you think is really spectacular when you look at it and make a painting that's absolutely boring. So it's really up to you uh, as the artist to see the beauty in any subject and be able to uh, portray it according to the way you ap apply the paint and, uh, and, and are able to envision it. I like to paint a variety of subjects. Uh, some painters are specialists in one particular area and they're very successful um, kind of working in that one area. Uh, I like to paint 
all different types of things. Anything that I that turns me on, I want to take a shot at painting it. So I have paintings of landscapes, still lifes, animals. Also, I do some wildlife, not a lot. I kind of jump around a little bit. So I'll do um, ocean scenes and land scenes and uh, western scenes. I, I just like to try my hand at different uh, subject matter. It just keeps it interesting for me. I just love to paint, so whenever I get the opportunity, and life throws us all, you know, different responsibilities that we have to take care of that keeps us away from the easel, but whenever I can kind of get that opportunity to paint, I want to jump in and, and do it. I, I like to take photographs of different places that I go, and so if I need some inspiration, I'll look through old, old photographs, and sometimes I have photos that I took 20 years ago that I didn't think much of at the time, but I'll look at it, and all of a sudden I'll see, that would make a terrific painting, and uh, you know, I will just, uh, in my studio, I'll just pop it up on a screen or make a print out of it, and I, I just like to do it. I mean, as far as uh, motivation, it doesn't take much to motivate me to paint. I, I just like the process of, of, um, of doing it. The way I got into teaching is I've had some terrific uh, teachers myself uh, as I studied, and um, I feel it's important to kind of pass on your knowledge. It's also, you know, a great way to augment your income as, as artists. We all know that it's an up and down situation. Sometimes you're selling a lot and sometimes not so much. And the bills just keep coming in no matter what. So you have to find ways that, that you enjoy uh, to bring in some extra income. And uh, teaching has always been that for me. Uh, I've been teaching for a long time. And I enjoy the interaction with, with people and, and I enjoy seeing them progress. It also helps me to progress because as I um, verbalize some of the concepts that I've learned and I've thought about over 30, 40 years uh, of doing this, that um, if I see people uh, enjoying and learning and getting better paintings out of, out of what I can help them with, it's very satisfying. I'd like to inspire others by sharing uh, what I know about painting and my experience, and hopefully that'll be an inspiration to them, whether they are just painting for their own enjoyment uh, or uh, need something to, to do in retirement. If, if there's something that I can share with them about making it more enjoyable for them, uh, I'm glad to do it. Well, that is Howard Friedland painting waterfalls in oil, and you can learn more about that brand new video at painttube.tv. Remember, there's a discount code for you up in the comments section. Take advantage of that today. Thank you for watching. I'm Eric Rhodes. Top artist Howard Friedland shares his insider secrets on how to paint beautiful, captivating waterfalls. It's all in his new video, Painting Waterfalls in Oil. In this workshop, I'm going to show you how I paint loosely and impressionistically to really capture the mood and the feeling and the motion of a waterfall. In this video, Howard shares his secret for getting all the details right. He'll show you exactly how he paints the damp, misty atmosphere that makes a waterfall really come alive. If your paintings tend to be tight and getting into the details too soon, I think this workshop will be great for you to loosen up your painting style. Howard reveals his four key elements into a living waterfall painting. He'll show you how to create each of these effects in your paintings. The first two are light and shadow, done Howard's way but it's the next two that really make the painting come to life. It may seem like magic how he's able to do all of this, but it's not. Howard has a step-by-step -step system to bring the outdoors into the controlled environment of his studio. From the early block-in, through the developmental stages, all the way to the finish, I'm gonna teach you how to paint a beautiful waterfall. In this video, he'll show you how he does it. 
And of course, a great waterfall painting isn't just about the waterfall itself. It's often the lush surrounding of trees, rocks, and cliffs that complete the story. Howard has developed, refined, and proven his techniques. His career has been long and very successful. He knows how to really make all the elements in his painting sing. With what you learn from Howard, everything will seem to work better. And with his technique, you may find yourself looking at your finished work and being amazed at how you did it. Howard breaks it all down in a step-by-step, -step, easy to learn format that you'll enjoy so much, it will seem effortless. Order the digital download version of Painting Waterfalls in Oil with Howard Friedland now, and you can have Howard talking to you in minutes. Or, if you prefer, the DVD version. Let us know, and we'll ship it right to your door.